Well, we are live. Hopefully, Kim is joining us. We, we did just see Kim Krauss briefly uh, loading up, but it looked like uh, it froze on her. Uh, I have put the link in the event, but what we wanted to do this week was invite some of our, our old friends from the creator site days to join us. Hopefully, some of them will jump in. We've certainly got some in the comment stream. Uh, I noticed Adrian Lee there, uh, who says it's the first time he's used Google Plus. Never mind Hangouts. So uh, nice to see, uh, nice to see somebody getting a, a fresh exposure to the platform. <laughs> Although apparently it's dead already. So uh, you know, <laughs> welcome to the wake. Um, do you know what? I'm going to kick off with that this week instead of our, our usual what you've been up to, Bill. I'm going to say what I've been up to. I finally got to the point where I'm fed up of arguing with people who say, oh, G plus is dead. From now on, I'm going to let them say it. I'm going to let them think it. And I'm going to carry on having great conversations, um, having a place that is the most lively place since the heyday of those forms. Um, and I'm not going to put them straight, because they don't want to hear it. What, what they mean with all of these posts is, I can't work G+, I wish it was dead. Um, you know, I, I've spent five years building up my Facebook profile, and when I go over to G+, <laughs> my stream isn't pre-populated with five years worth of this stuff, so it doesn't look the same. Well, you know what? Google Plus is never going to be Facebook. It was never meant to be. There is no evidence anywhere that G+, was supposed to be Facebook. It's also not going to be Twitter. Twitter is social media light. 140 characters. Say whatever's on your mind right now as long as it will fit in that, which with a lot of people it certainly will. Some of them have spare characters left over. <laughs> and it's not going to be LinkedIn. LinkedIn is really focused on a niche. It's the professional site. If you want to talk about work, if you want to do B2B stuff, LinkedIn is a great place to be. G plus is not going to be any of those. It's not supposed to be. And as long as people want to keep comparing it to those things, I think it's always going to come out second best. And if that's what they want to do, I suppose, let them. Um, I think G plus is a fascinating thing in its own right. I don't think it depends on the bells and whistles. You know, I don't think... HOAs and photos were what defined G+. What defined G+, was that I can put a post here that I couldn't put on Facebook. Because for a start, I want to have carriage returns without having to hold shift because it immediately wants to post it. It can't believe that anyone could put more than one paragraph together for Facebook. You know, people aren't that clever, are they? Um, I like the fact that I can have... And you run out of characters too quickly. Yeah. So the ability to actually put together a meaningful post, and it, guys, if you're watching this, you've seen my post. I like long posts. If it's something very, very brief, you probably won't bother saying it at all because it's probably too obvious. So a place where I can put together a decent length post was always essential to me. You know, LinkedIn was close, but it didn't have the formatting. I couldn't make bold. I couldn't make italic text. Uh, as easily on on that platform, and I'm not cheap I'm not sorry for it. What about you guys? What why why do you enjoy G plus? In looking at the patents I look at, I see some opportunities there that are revealed that talk about Google's social network. Uh, one of them is sort of a return to agent rank. They talk about authoritative users and uh, how they may be associated with specific queries and topics. Uh, there was a, a patent that talked about brand identifiers and how Google may take hashtags that people associate with brands and use those to talk about that brand and to let people search for that brand. So uh, 
my friend Barbara recently has been getting experimented upon by Google with uh, highlighted uh, entity names and brand names. Uh, they show up highlighted, surrounded by red, sort of like the uh, uh, SEO book, no follow uh, highlight, the red square around the uh, entity name. And it's interesting to see and wonder what Google might do with that. But it, Google Plus does feel like a big experiment, experimental playground for Google to try new things at, on. You know, they, they gain a lot of information about their users through their users' interactions with other people. So, so what, what you're saying is basically it's... It's one of those mazes, and where the rats in it, and you, you fancy being one of those rats. Absolutely. Excellent. I, I don't see anything wrong with that. Hey, Adrian, good to see you. Hi, all. <laughs> <laughs> now, Adrian Yitley is. I, I'm delighted to see him because he was this young little whippersnapper when we. When we <laughs> He was kind of, you were kind of the young one of the group when we first opened Create a Site Forum. Not well, the youngest, that, that was uh, probably Mick. Yeah, well I mean I'm what, uh, I'm 33 now and that was good 15 years ago. <laughs> so yeah, I was a teenager when I first got into the uh, into the forum, so well the, the old Yahoo group as it was, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> there was... There was something special about that place, and I, I've tried over the years to. to um, part of it was was what we identified at the time. We had a very diverse group. Um, I mean, yourself, you were an IT background, correct, Adrian? Uh, I mean, at the time, yeah, I was not all that long out of school, um, trying to work out what I was doing, really, and so I was spending my spare time finding out about web development, thought, oh, I could do with some, how do I, how do I get a site sort of found on the internet, how do I, how do, I do that, oh, uh, well, oh, there's this Yahoo group, I'll just, I'll just see, that seems quite helpful, I'll, I'll dip into that, and it basically developed from there, and... Yeah, I've, I've done front-end web development since, and I've since stepped out of it again, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, Bill, you were running uh, you were running some sites, weren't you? I wasn't really running. I was doing SEO. I was an in-house SEO for a company in Delaware that was doing corporations for other people. And then I... I uh, Started doing SEO for a law firm website. So those were the ones I was working on during the early days of uh, create a site forums. Mm -hmm. Or the Yahoo group precursor to create a site. Yeah. They talk about small business promotion and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had, we had Mick, who I, I mentioned a minute ago. Now, Mick, if I remember right, wasn't he 15? At the time we opened the forums, or, or at least when he joined the groups, oh, struggling to remember, to be honest. Um, I can't remember the the. I suppose there was kind of the four of us that kind of took the group from the Yahoo group into Create Site forums. Essentially, I mean that was you, you two guys, Kim and myself. I kind of thought was that kind of core little little group, um, and sort of Jill joined. I think not too long after we got the got got the forums going. I think there was a few other guys sort of involved, but I think there was sort of many of that four of us. I, I, I sort of struggle to remember who else kind of w w was there. I mean, we are talking what early two thousands, aren't we? So right, ninety eight, no, two thousand three. It was two thousand two. It was September two thousand two. It was the very first public post on Creator Site. <laughs> I, I visited the forums this weekend, and I noticed I joined Create a Site forums August thirty first, two thousand and two. Wow. Yeah. Um, 
Kim says she can't quite seem to get in. Oh, <laughs> like there we go. Mick was 14. Cool, blimey. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and I think he was in Denmark. So that's certainly something in Scandinavia is, is what I'm remembering. Uh, Kim, of course, had uh, been in-house for a company in UX and then branched out into web promotion from there and was one of the first couple of people I knew who really straddled um, the usability and SEO stuff. Um, I mean, literally, I, I could think of about three people back in the day. Uh, obviously, Shari, Shari Thoreau, and Matt Bailey, if you remember as well, kind of did the usability and SEO. But, you know, it, it was a field of three people. Um, and none of them had their own forum. Uh, you know, Kim wins by default. <laughs> yeah. Now, hey, Terry, and it picked up really quickly. Terry, you you were in the wrong form. You were in our help queue. I think you muted. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't. Didn't really get into forms until I joined. Uh, I help you. I was mainly still working out of uh, iSearch newsletter. That's kind of how I ended up on uh, I Help You. Was uh, I didn't have anywhere to to publish my rants, so uh, it seemed like I fit in over there. <laughs> okay, now Kim here is talking about um, the Create PC group itself. Uh, which was originally eGroups before Yahoo took it over, if I remember rightly, and then it became a Yahoo group. Uh, but that was the Create Piece, which was C R E 8 PC, um, which was a number plate, if I remember correctly, or, or was going to be a number plate. But anyway, uh, August 1998 was the start of that group, which was around about the time I think I first met Kim was. Uh, she popped into another forum that I was at, uh, the Web Position Gold's official sort of forum, Market Position Talk. And a lot of people back then, all they wanted to know was how to get a doorway page to rank. Um, and yeah. if you started to talk about conversions, not our job, if you started to talk about, you know, targeting the right terms to actually get customers, not our job. We're paid to put these words Oh, page one, and so you can imagine that when Kim went in and started talking about user experience, they weren't exactly <laughs> receptive. Uh, so naturally, I, I said, "No, look, guys, she's right." And you may not know her. This is her first post in the forum, but listen, because this is what I'm telling you. If you're chasing rankings that aren't going to work, if you're chasing getting hundreds of people to your page that aren't going to be impressed by it, what you're doing is paying for bad publicity. Mm -hmm. The last thing you want to do is give hundreds of people a bad experience instead of 10. I've tried joining other forums since and posting in them. And, you know, you, you end up running into that dominant alpha male who decides that you've got to go through some type of test before you're allowed to say anything that might be construed as authoritative. <laughs> it's it's risky. Obviously, you didn't notice it, Bill, but you were the dominant alpha male back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to have a very open policy, but it was something... I mean, people may not realize it, but we talked behind the scenes. The admin area of that forum was as busy as the public side. There were as many posts that people couldn't see as posts they could. And I, I, I'm still scared now looking at Create Site Forum, seeing my post count on there, and then thinking how many of those are actually even on the public end of it, and how much was done behind the scenes in just organizing stuff and debates about what was going on, and, and members and spam and everything else that goes along with running one of those things. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I remember yeah, when you had to modify the form because it used to show your post count, but that included posts made in areas they couldn't see, and we didn't want to give away that we're having a lot of conversations. <laughs> well, I mean, I remember stuff, you know, when um, Dave Child came on and did the, the admin stuff, 
and um, you know we had the issue where we had the website hospital and people were complaining because they, they put things in the website hospital and then the website hospital would start ranking better for their site than their site did um, for, the, for the, the, the the right search terms. So I think Dave had to come up with this this uh, relatively ingenious scheme, it seemed like at the time, where you basically reversed the URL so that, you know, you see it on the page, it looked correct, but the link you actually clicked on went through some fancy reversing of the of the texting you know there was a whole thread on the admin area in the background that <laughs> was all discussing that and him doing things and that yeah it was uh, incredible <laughs> yeah. uh, Bill you had something you were trying to say a second ago no no I wasn't but uh, Adrian mentioned the website hospital and I had to admit I love that section I learned so much from that from trying to help other people uh, from looking at other people's responses to question to asking for assistance with their sites. I remember when uh, the guy who uh, owned Plenty of Fish posted his site. I think a dozen people uh, posted immediately. <laughs> they hated the uh, uh, background. I think it was a shark. Yeah, he had, he had dolphins. I remember at one stage. Okay. I don't know if they were, you know, uh, tuna friendly dolphins to make up for, you know, dolphin friendly tuna. Yeah, that that site ended up doing pretty good. I think I remember. Yeah, it certainly did. Sold mm -hmm. for a few bucks too. The thing, <laughs> the thing that I loved about the website hospital was, it was an area to get people involved. It was it, look. When we help you, don't give us thanks. Hop into the website hospital and help somebody else. You don't have to be an expert. Give your view of what you see. Be yeah. honest about how you feel about other people's site. And it it got people into that pay it back and pay it forward kind of mentality, which I think was what set us apart. I mean, that's exactly how I got into it with the, the, the Yahoo group beforehand. I think, you know, people would post on there about stuff and we start, and, and it took me a while before I felt confident enough to kind of have a go and say, this is what I think of your site. And I'm talking about the code and the way it works and all that kind of stuff. But it was a fantastic learning experience itself to to start analysing someone else's site and start describing what you think of it. You, you know, you, you start understanding it better yourself by going through that process, I think as well, so it makes you think a lot more about what it is you're you're, you're talking about. Yeah. Hey Joe, good to have you join us. Yeah, hey Joe, glad to be here. Yeah. Hey Joe. Long time. Yeah. Now, Joe, you I always remember because you were one of those designers who was a bit skeptical of us SEO types. Um, I quite rightly <laughs> so, if you read the most <laughs> SEO stuff out there. Um, well, well, I had a client who was entirely enamored with the worst of SEO and so I spent a lot of time early on fighting with him about what really he should be doing. That's how I got started, yep. looking for arguments. <laughs> yes, um, and it, there was something about the forum that if you were fit you only had to visit a couple of times and you were hooked because there was yeah. a different kind of conversation. Um, and I think Bill highlighted it there. There's a lot of forms where you got into and the regulars were there to talk down to you rather than encourage you to tell them something. Yeah, totally. Um, um, I, I, okay. I found that I, I help you. It was... Doug's forum and the moderators were there to talk to you. Jill, Jill and Doug and a few others had very strong opinions and, you know, they put them strongly. Yeah, but in the end, that's what killed it, too, was his strong opinion. Yeah. yeah. Or rather, intolerance, or at least for me, that's what it was, the intolerance and the fact that he could even be wrong and be intolerant uh, was what finally made me go, I got better things to do. Mm -hmm. I'm now, out I, of here. I did like some of the moderators. I mean, Alan Parsons. Don't get me wrong, myself and some of the other sort of harder core SEOs would tease him mercilessly about <laughs> your white hat stance. 
uh, at all the conferences, but I enjoyed talking with him at all the conferences. He had some some good points. Um, he also a very smart guy. <laughs> yeah. Whereas Doug was the guy that that made me first coin the term white hat supremacist. Uh, <laughs> I, I really did sometimes imagine him sitting in a little white hood, pulled right over, burning spammers. <laughs> and you were always a dark grey, weren't you? <laughs> my my favourite was when Peter would come in, and you could see he's just pushing the buttons, left and right. Like, And we'd be in the back actually saying, hey, Doug, he's pushing your buttons. Come on. You know. Peter Devanza? Yeah, yeah, one of my favorite. Uh, he actually changed uh, some of my views on spam and whatnot. Uh, became basically decided that he was right that uh, the guidelines were not necessarily in everybody's best interest. Yeah, uh, John Moore, who's a, a regular of the show, says uh, he was very, very skeptical about the SEO people he encountered. He was so relieved to find the folks here on G+. And great site so sounds great. It seriously was. And you know, it, it is still out there, John. It's To me, it's not what it was. Um, because the expectation has changed. People don't seem to want forums as much these days. A lot of people, it, it's all about sharing the tips on their blog where they can get all the link juice for it still. Um, yeah. I think there's far too much of this thing, you probably heard me talk about it before, but I always say it's amazing how much good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit, and that's exactly true. It's amazing how much you can teach if you don't care who gets the link juice. I don't. I'm pretty sure I saw Bill uh, tweeting about personal brand in the last day or two. <laughs> <laughs> but that goes into the self promotion itself. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I kind of get to the point. Where some people, I just won't sit on a panel with them anymore. Come to that decision last Friday. It's one of those odd things, though, because do you know what? Creator site didn't. You know, we didn't slap it with branding everywhere. We we didn't have very heavy self promotion. We had a minimalist. Um, Policy on signatures, which people could or could, or you know, they, if they wanted to turn them off in their preferences, they wouldn't even see our signatures. Um, the default was that they were on, but you know, we had a tight character limit. We asked for one link only, and yet the number of people. I mean, Bill, that that's where you first kind of made your name, wasn't it? Was personal branding because people got to know you through that. They got to know your thought process and really appreciate that. And very soon they were talking about Bill Slowski of Creator Site, and in the same way that they were talking about Kim Krause and Creator Site, and Black Knight of Creator Site, my name at the time. And personal branding still worked because what you were branding was what you knew, and you didn't have to have your own blog to, to benefit from that, did you? Right. I, I didn't help myself by having a username that was. Uh, Unpronounceable to most people. I use the name Fragadocio. <laughs> uh -huh. So when I when I actually started meeting people at conferences in real life, uh, and told them I was from Creative Site Forums and I used that username. Oh yeah, you're that guy. Uh huh. <laughs> Yeah. There's everything about patents ever, yeah. yeah. Everyone would, would just shorten it to, to brag anyway, wouldn't they? Yeah. Um, I'm not too pretty, unfortunately. Yeah, see, Adrian and Joe got it right because they, they didn't bother with, with flash names. You know, they used their real names right from the start. Yeah. All the time, yeah. I mean, I think that was a bit about Criticize as well. I mean, I think um, a lot of the longer term members and stuff, generally our avatar was. A picture of our face, that kind of thing. There, we did have a few guys using the real names and stuff, and yeah, a couple of you guys there who've become quite well known without doing that bit. But yeah, you know, I, I think it was it was a bit more personal. Yeah, I mean, in some cases. Mhm. Mm yeah. Um. There definitely was that. The, the, 
tendency in other forms at that time was definitely, you know, an avatar, a picture that represented something about you rather than a picture of yourself. And we never really discussed it as such, except after the event when we just sort of noticed it. But yeah, we yeah. decided to just look. I want to have an honest conversation, so this is me. And I think we all approached it at, at that kind of level. We just felt that to have the conversation we wanted, the, the, the forum names are fine, but we just wanted our face there so people could see who was, was dealing with them. Yeah, I mean, I've also, you know, you've said so. Like, yeah, back then I, I was uh, a fairly uh, younger guy. <laughs> I didn't didn't really. I, I was I wasn't even in the industry, you know, for quite a long time. And it was just a case of, well, I didn't really want to use my silly little um, web, you know, handle username, whatever that I use for some stupid computer game or something. I kind of, well, I can't really think of anything suitable. So I thought I'd just use my name then. I might as well just go for that. <laughs> yeah, get your coat built. You've pulled. As the same over here. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, Zer, you are not alone. Bill has a huge fan club, and he did at the time. Uh, the, the forums were filled every day with people referring to the fact. Bill was like this walking encyclopedia. Absolutely, yeah. Um, they, they say that what they did to create Evernote was clone a tiny bit of Bill's <laughs> You just had this ability that no matter what topic, you seem to have read something and be able to find it quickly again. Your your abilities as a researcher, probably honed during your law degree, really shone there. I was trying to learn as much as I could so I could do something for a living online. Yeah. Read about usability, read about e commerce, read about SEO. Read about marketing. You know, uh, if it's relevant, share it. Talk about it. Have a discussion about it. Yeah. You know, that was part of the fun of the forums. We had a lot of discussions. Oh, yeah. And conversations covered a lot of things. And most of the time, they were really, really good. There was, of course, one thing we used to call the Phil and Jill show. <laughs> um, now those two stood out because Phil was strongly opinionated. Um, he'd have said grey hat. Public. Um, Jill was a strongly opinionated white hat, ethical SCI. Mm -hmm. um, Jill couldn't decide what the hell I was. Um, <laughs> she did call me a white hat. Uh, I firmly said, "Well, look, under this, this, I'm definitely a black hat." That is, there are no hats. There are strategies and there are the right strategies and the wrong strategies, there are long term plans and short term plans and most of all there is always a risk and the whole point is to understand the level of risk and plan for it. You know, so if you've invested a lot of time in a technique, an SEO technique, and you've spent a lot of money building up content that plays to that technique and then suddenly that technique changes, even if it was right, even if it was as ethical as anything, you've still got to turn around to that client and say, oops, sorry, you know where we spent that 30000 budget on building all of that? Yeah, well, it's no longer worth anything. <laughs> oops. It can happen. Um, and it, it's one of those things. There are strategies. And when you're dealing in business, you are trying to optimize a lot of different things. You're trying to give the best experience to the customer you can, but you're also trying to minimize the expenses and maximize the return on investment. Uh, and I'd probably say there's probably some stuff you were promoting, God, probably must be getting on for 15 years ago around kind of HD access files uh, and um, that, that sort of stuff that now, some of that stuff is pretty standard practice and a lot of things, you know, you see how uh, 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 God, I've been out of the industry for so long now, some of these words are escaping me. Um, some of the like friendly web URLs and that kind of thing, the way that stuff happens now, is pretty much that same basic idea that, I mean, I can't remember how it started, but I remember you talking about it a good number of years ago, and that was kind of considered like a bit of a black hat kind of practice back at the time. Oh, URL rewriting was thought to be yes. black hat. Yeah. Um, partly because I, I think less people had worked on database sites. You know, WordPress wasn't around, never mind a major yeah. platform. Uh, it's for on a movable type hadn't quite caught on yet. 
Um, so most people were dealing with static sites generated with, if, if we were really unlucky, something like front page. If we were even more unlucky than that, it was generated with Microsoft Word. Uh, you <laughs> <didn't code that. laughs> yeah. I used front, use front page for years. It's not the tool, it's the tool behind the tool. <laughs> There are workarounds to make front page work very well. Well, you, you had to use it a certain way. You had to write it and then mark it up. If you tried to do it before, like, and do it as you go, as if you were writing it, it didn't work properly. It, it bloated the code. Yeah. So knowing that, I marked mine up like that. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I was a Dreamweaver fan simply for the fact that... Yeah. You could put the includes there in your version, and it would generate static pages with the bits in it. It saved your time. It had the advantage of a CMS without doing a CMS. Front page was doing that in the second version. Yeah. Using yeah. HTML, HTTP uh, code to add the includes, oh, which well, was I, really I, good for people who were non-programmers. Worked really well. I, I used them all. I even tried a, uh, a Maya. Do you remember that one? The web browser that also... A Maya? An editor? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to know what people were using. But to be honest, my favorite editor was still Notepad. Uh, and to this day, Notepad++ is how I build my sites. Yeah, same. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I ended up going to a product called Notetab for doing ASP programming rather than using, you know, the big Microsoft suites that wrote crappy code uh, yeah. and relied on configuration files and all kinds of other website abominations. Yeah, so it, it's, it's funny how many people that, you know, get very, very serious about the SEO and very, very serious about websites it comes down to working in text because you really do want to have character specific control of that, that code and to know exactly what's going on. And any editor, no matter how smart, in fact, I'd almost say the smarter the software is, the more it tries to second guess you. Oh, yeah. And can be really obnoxious when it does it. Yes. Yes. Look, I know that most people do that. That's why I'm not. There would not be an advantage in doing what most people did. Right. I want to do it better. <laughs> <laughs> There's never an advantage in doing what everyone else is doing because then you can only rank as well as they did. It's the guy who can take that and go the next step. They're the guys on top. Yeah. That's um, why I never worry about people reverse engineering anything I do. I know in the end, if they're, they have to copy me, then they'll only be as good as I am where I'm still hopefully growing and learning, right? Getting even better. Yeah. Um, it's, oh, there's, there's John. Hey, um, John. I'll give him a second to oh, load up. Is hopefully it'll, uh, it'll play well. The the thing I used to love most about Creator Summit was that we did have massively different opinions coming together. Um, and we were kind of approaching things from all sides. If you remember, Barry Welford always used to uh, love sharing the, the thing about you know the three blind men and the elephant, uh, touching the different parts of it and describing what they say. So you've got one of that the trunk saying, oh, an elephant is, is like a snake. I can, I can definitely feel it's, it's like a snake. And it, there's one at the side, no, an elephant is, is like a wall. It's, it's big and flat and stretches out in both directions. Um, because we came at things in so many different directions and trusted each other, I think it gave us so many different perspectives on things that it was one of the most well-rounded forums 
I mean, I was saying, Kim always had that idea of the holistic approach, uh, and I mean that that really came through. I mean, you know, we talk about um, user experience along with um, SEO. I mean, accessibility was a fair, fairly big topic of discussion as well. I mean, us, you know, I think Bill first got me into the idea of web standards and kind of accessibility. I mean, that was a big thing that Joe Joe brought through as well, and then a few other guys, and and that was always a very big big part of it. But it was that very much different perspectives, all all just trying to everyone was just trying to make a good website and make it successful and whatever success meant for that website there's all lots of very different things and, and it were people were quite comfortable discussing stuff without saying no your way's wrong your way is wrong my way's right kind of thing it, it was more kind of a sharing of, of thoughts and ideas rather than a I'm better than you sort of approach yeah and putting the idea out there that accessibility can be a competitive advantage yeah, uh, it was something that many people missed, but a lot of people have trouble reading from a monitor, hearing when you when you play something some audio, uh, and if you if you address those types of issues, you can reach a lot more people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. The idea that you know those images that you've shared. Okay, look, AI is getting a lot better. Um, Google, you know, it's great. It can recognize pictures of cats. But maybe, you know, you want to show products that aren't cats. If you've got a pet shop, great, Google's there. Uh, and it can recognize most landmarks as well. So if you want to sell London Bridge, uh, the Eiffel Tower, Google is all set for that. Uh, hasn't quite added the Buy Now button to, to those yet. Uh, I'm sure if you keep on putting regulations on Google, they will start doing so, though. Uh, <laughs> some news that, that Google is by now. On, on PDFs recently, yep. and you know my, my my thought is question is when is Google going to start doing OCR on web images? How many people came to the website hospital with uh, the address of their business in a picture, as a picture, and they yeah. couldn't understand why they weren't getting any traffic to the website. Mm -hmm. A lot of people. So do you think those changes are good or are they problematic? I mean, like thinking back when we looked at these websites and if someone came in with a JavaScript site or like text and images, we'd say, oh man, this is like classical beginner's mistake. You should fix this stuff up. And now that or assuming Google like gets better at all of these things and recognizes text and images, handles JavaScript fine. Is that going to encourage people to do more of these crazy things, or is that just kind of like filling in the gaps? I I think I'd be quite happy if it encouraged people to do more adventurous things, but ultimately I think people need to know how something works and why it works and how much effort went into working out yeah, that site will work now, but here's, here's why it took 10 years to get to that stage and why it still might not be great for customers. You know, Google can do this because they've invested in one. But your next, your next visitor may be in a country that's not particularly rich. They're using, you know, Windows 95 because that was the machine they picked up. And their browser is Internet Explorer and deal with it, you know. They still want a good experience. But do you think that's kind of where SEO changed, too? I've always believed, right, that kind of SEO went where we knew when we got the search engine to when we got the people from the search engine to the page that the job was only half done. So we cared about all these things on the page, whereas these days, I believe a lot of SEO believe they just have to drive traffic, numbers count, doesn't matter if it's not targeted, and that it doesn't mean anything, it doesn't add to sales, but they're driving a lot of traffic, uh, you know, uh, that's what I find, uh, you know, is, I think that's that always a big change. That was happening 10, 12 years ago. There was so many people who were interested in getting to number one on the ranking list and getting lots of page hits. And I still, I still, I'm working with people now who still talk about hits 
as a as a term, and that that is stuck in their in their <laughs> in their language vocabulary. Uh-huh. But still, we're still stuck there. <laughs> uh-huh. We do so, want to point out that hits is actually an acronym. Uh, it means how idiots track success. <laughs> so I tried Google's uh, data highlighter tool this past week, and it worked really, really well. And I was surprised by it. But I've been doing some smart things lately, like making sure that Google could crawl my JavaScript and CSS. And I think that helped Google be able to recognize what the patterns are on those pages and label things better. Yeah. Uh, because I, I, was, I was testing out uh, a data highlighter not long back. It took me ages to get the little green marks off the screen, though. <laughs> I'm never going to show that one again. Tip X. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there was somebody who tried to edit that their site that way in the website hospital at some stage. <laughs> <laughs> it was, though, one of those things. I think Kim's background in usability brought other people with you know, an interest in accessibility, usability, um, and other sides of design than just whether it's sold. And I think altogether that made the whole thing richer. You know, I remember that. Do you remember the big fuss when some usability folks went to SMX, heard some of the advice, didn't listen very well, and then you know the craptastic adventures of SMX was, I think, the 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 thread. And we had this long debate. Some of the usability people really went sort of up in arms about the advice, which wasn't what was said. And eventually, you know, we went in there and I said, that actually. Don't be hating on SEOs. SEOs are doing accessibility. They are thinking of one user that even you progressive designers aren't thinking of. We're thinking of a user that is blind, doesn't actually understand the words, only recognizes them, uh, can't deal with images, can't deal with sound. Uh, yeah, that, that's, the, that's the one there. Um, Alphabet. There's always a post that sticks in my memory from from Grumpus, and he talked about um, I think it was opening a jar of peanuts or something, and he said it took him ages to try and work out how to open this jar of peanuts, and and in the end it was something really stupid. I can't, I can't remember what it was that, that happened, but he he uh, the, the line that the quote he came out with was something like uh, make something idiot proof, and the world will find better idiots. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, evolution is always working to create better idiots, and. It, it's something funny enough. I mean, I, I learned about what fail safe really means by, by working on the railways um, and the signal system and how that had to be designed so that when everything goes wrong, you know, look, when the power fails, it fails to make the brakes on. You have power, take the brakes off. You don't have power brakes, you have power turns the brakes off so that in the event of a power cut, the brakes come on. Um, in the event of signal failure, it automatically goes to red. And if you don't see it because the bulb is blown, there's an extra signal that, that stops the train automatically. All of these things taught me a lot, and it taught me to think about fail safes in a whole different way. And I enjoyed bringing that to accessibility and seeing how accessibility was similar. You know, if if somebody doesn't have CSS, if somebody doesn't have channels, how does your site degrade for those people? Does it? What will happen if JavaScript is disabled in their browser? What will your site look like? And there's a lot of sites out there today with sliders and WordPress-based stuff that, if JavaScript is off, it's unusable. I, I'm even doing things now that because I um, I work in local government. We do I do do with stats and demographics and data analysis and that kind of thing. But we we, we manage a couple of little websites and there's stuff on one of those websites now that ten years ago I, w- I I wouldn't have dared do and I kind of I cringe at myself for doing it. But I, I these days I just don't have the time and resources to manage it properly and I kind of you know, I kind of hurt myself with it. <laughs> but back in the day, but you my brain. 
it's kind of a reflection of the modern age, too. There's a lot less people with JavaScript turned off because there's a lot less vulnerabilities. Uh, for years, I wouldn't turn JavaScript on because uh, all the cross-browser crap, and especially when you, like, run almost exclusively on Internet Explorer, John Cringes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so... But I think that's a lot less of an issue uh, than it was in the past. Unless it's uh, Google, then... Yeah. I mean, there are, always, there are always different ways to, to handle this, like the JavaScript type content, and li like it was before, where you could take a Word doc and export it as HTML and call it a website. Um, lots of people, or, or at least some people, take the craziest JavaScript frameworks, compile them all together, and create this gigantic bloated application that's actually just a simple web form. So it's, it's something where you kind of have to find the right tool. And I think what kind of differentiates the experts from the beginners with all of these things is, is not being able to use so many tools, but knowing which tool to use when and when to leave all of these other things away. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring up frameworks, because this is a thing I wrestled with recently, was I was using uh, Bootstrap. The site was using Bootstrap. And normally, I would go through Bootstrap and take out the, the parts they weren't using yep, to minimize the code. But, of course, they're using uh, Content Delivery Network, CDN. And I said, actually, do you know what? Stick with the full thing, because more people, the chances are, with so many sites using it these days, there's a high chance somebody has that cached in a session, and it'll probably be the full version. So actually, for a lot of people, it will be more useful to have the same version they'd be requesting otherwise, rather than having to download 90% of what they've already got 100% of because it's got a different file extension because it's a different version. Yeah, that's that's really subtle. I think it's it's tricky on the one hand because there, there is so much caching going on, all of these CDNs that are out there nowadays, and the average user has visited 500 websites that might have used the same framework. So if you can reuse that, that's awesome. But at the same time, you kind of have to be careful that you don't get lazy and that you don't like create a website that's gigantic and bloated just because everyone else is on DSL and has like a high-speed internet connection. Because there's still lots of people out there that I don't know have a phone that have a really slow internet connection that still might be interested in in getting something from your website or understanding something, learning about something that you have on your website. Um, and it's making me rethink again. The reason I haven't jumped on Schema as much as I might have, as, certainly as much as some, is that it's bloating code. It's adding a lot of code which my users aren't getting. It depends how it's done, I know, Terry. But <laughs> still, it's adding, if, if you're adding depth to it, it is adding a lot of code and I can't buy the character, it's adding bytes of code that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And, you know, Google is the one that's always telling me, if if it's not for users, don't do it. You know? <laughs> so I have tried to abide by that and think, look, if a user can't benefit from this, should I put it in? Especially as, you know, this is extra code. Um, so I think there's still things we, we wrestle with today. Hey, Kim. Uh, Eamon, do you use uh, XML sitemaps? I do with some... I don't need it at the moment. Um, I, I did something different recently. Um, and it's part experiment and part putting my own code where my mouth is. I have gone down to a five-page site. I've taken away all the old articles. Um, I've um, got rid of a lot of the things I was doing because ultimately most of my customers know who I am, 
they're not searching for SEO. If you're looking for SEO, if you're searching SEO company, you're almost certainly going to go with the cheaper provider. Um, you're looking for an agency, and usually you're looking for a localish agency that's cheap. That's not me. That's not what I do. Um, I'm kind of the, the architect guy. I'm, I'm the guy you get in after you've had a bad experience with some of those other agencies. <laughs> after those other agencies have, have done what they can do, and you're kind of going, great, we've done all that, what's next? And you know what? They've run out of things on people's blogs to read to tell them what to do next. <laughs> the people who come to me are the people who are actually searching for my name most of the time. So that's why I, I, went, I went with a minimal site. Here's how you get in touch. You already know why you want to get in touch. Here's how you get in touch. And I'm quite happy with that. But it, I, it was a conscious decision because I wanted to show that concept to people. That look, the idea of everyone's got to have a big blog and everyone's got to be doing the social media thing and everyone's got to be doing this and doing that. No, look, you don't. You have to know what your market is and be serving your customers the way they want to be served. So putting your value proposition on your pages in five or six pages and making it minimal is a better experience for you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, literally, a lot of the people who want to get in touch, they just want to know how to get in contact and just enough information that they're sure it is the right guy. Oh, yeah, that's the Amazon Johns I'm talking about. And that's it. Yeah. So you got a nice big uh, black knight picture on there, have you done? <laughs> <laughs> yep, and it's it's it is very minimal. Um, I've had people say, "My God, that looks really old." Well, it might do, but it's not. But if you look at the code, you would think it was old because it is clean, very very clean. You know, I I remember the days when we would you know work hard to get a page in under fifteen k. <laughs> it's called bright in your work. There's not enough of it, in my opinion. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm using a, a JavaScript framework. I'm using CSS, but the page itself is very, very lean. There's no extra images because that's not what my customers are after. Um, you know, so you look on a lot of SEO sites. Oh, look. There's a picture of a search result. I've never seen one of those before. You know. Um, or, oh, look, there's the picture of that, that girl from the photo stock thing answering the phone. Oh, I'm glad she works there as well. That's the 50th company this week. You know, and a, a picture of a world in case you didn't quite understand they were global. You know, we've got to have a global map. <laughs> got to be corporate blue. <laughs> John, John is in fits there. I mean, can you imagine if Google was run the way that a lot of these companies is? What would Google's homepage look like? There, someone did a blog post. It, it must be like I don't know, seven or eight years ago. Uh, if like Google homepage was SEO the way that people like to SEO things, like with links on it, link exchange and. Links to deep content, recent searches linked below, all of these things. <laughs> it's totally hilarious, but I, I have the hardest time finding it. Yeah, don't, don't forget the uh, the feel lucky button would, would be the feel lucky, <laughs> fortunate, quite prosperous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, the funny thing is uh, we, we don't always do a great job of, of SEO, so it's... It's always a, a tricky balance, I guess, between something like, like what you do, where people are searching explicitly for you and trying to rank for a broader term, where maybe you want people who don't really know about you yet. And finding that balance is something that I think everyone needs to find for themselves. And sometimes you start off with one thing in the beginning, and you kind of change that over time. And that's, that's fine, too. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Google was hiring SEOs for the Google Store. Yeah, I mean we have like we we have lots of people who run services at Google, and to some extent, like having some help on SEO makes makes a lot of sense. It's not that 
they're going to go out and buy links or do anything crazy. But even from a technical point of view, there's a lot of things that someone who makes a website really well, like the smart engineers that we have, they might not be thinking about like what a search engine might be doing when it runs across there. Or things like finding the right titles that work well for users. That's not not always so trivial. Like you have people who write, write great content, you have people who make a great website, but finding someone who can help make titles mm -hmm. that encourage people to go through, that's, that's not, not that easy sometimes. Yeah. Um, one thing I've really learned is that there is no easy SEO. Um, there's people who try and make it so. There's people who try and create, you know, 10 steps and paint by numbers, but it always breaks down the same as, do you know what, there isn't default design. You know, design is always depending on who's going to use it, how they're going to use it, and what for. It's always about the user experience and fit for purpose. Um, and <sighs> why is that so hard for people? Hey, Kim. Hi. Hi, Kim. Hey. <laughs> oh, Sorry, I'm me, having that, that's, that's big issues. Your, your alley, their user experience. Why is it so hard for people to, to break away from paint by numbers for everything? Money. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> money, 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 money. <laughs> it is... So isn't it? Uh, you know, it's going to cost to develop a site that's unique. So let's go with WordPress. Um, you want a proper theme done by somebody, you know, who's who's very competent. Uh, if if you don't know Joe Dolson, um, everyone that's, that's follow him. The guy is an artist, as far as I'm concerned. He's an artist with code. He does great design. What would um, you know? Uh, what what's a typical sort of design? Right, how long does it take and, and what kind of cost does it have, Joe? Oh. Design, I mean, design is almost impossible to price in an abstract way. Um, it all depends on you know, how complex the design is and how much data are you presenting. But, you know, a really basic site could be, you know, simple, maybe 2,500 to 5,000. Um, but a larger site could be 50,000 to 100,000. It all depends on what you're trying to do. Um, and that's the part where people go, but, but I saw a WordPress theme for $50. And, um, yeah, like, <laughs> you don't have a website yet. You've just got a theme. <laughs> that, 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 theme. It might be good. <laughs> that was exactly why I initially got interested in, in web development back in back in secondary school when I was or, like 1994 when I was, what, 13 or something, and um, the school I was at, they, they do like the, the Preschool's Exploratory Society, and some, some kids had gone up to Svalbard, I think it was, and our school, for some reason, was picked to put some of their, the, the information about the expedition on, on a website, so we got taught, so I learned HTML in 1994, um, trying, to, trying to set that up, and our teacher was telling us, God, yeah, there's people out there who will charge £3,000 for a three-page website. Well, I'm thinking, God, we're 13-year-olds. We can make that, you know, back in Internet Explorer 3, Netscape, you know, stuff back in those days. It's like, wow, we can do this in, like, a couple of days kind of thing. We, we can earn thousands of pounds, you know, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, for, for me, it was different. Um, people sometimes look at me like, oh, I'm weird. I love the internet, so the reason I got into the commercial side of it was I wanted people to make money of it from it in a way that worked for users, because otherwise people were going to make money from it in a way that didn't. Um, and I was worried that advertising and the end users, you know, the sites of today that fund the internet, might not have been successful enough. And what we would have ended up with is more of the ISPs running everything and wanting the money for everything. And I didn't think that was going to work out as well. Yeah, you know, I think we need a free economy on the internet, and for that to work, it meant that more people needed to be able to make money. Yeah. I think that the more people who have a financial stake and uh, are able to use the web to make a living, 
the freer the internet generally, but you know, becomes the the sooner we get gatekeepers or people wanting to kind of gatekeep mm -hmm. the internet, the sooner we get into real problems because the, the, it, when it's one person, anybody can make a bad decision, no matter who that that person is. Um, it's possible to put a lot more pressure on one or two companies, even giant companies, than it is to put pressure on a thousand companies in a thousand countries. Yeah. They don't know what they don't know. That's what I keep running into. Mm -hmm. They they just they don't know they don't have you know, website owners from the get go, they're still back at twenty years ago, build it and they will come. And I've been spending a lot of time kind of going back and saying, no, that's not the way it works. Mm -hmm. You can build it and they will not come and here are all the reasons why. And just to get them to even consider the whole full circle takes a lot of time and a lot of education. And But if you can whittle it down to little sound bites and a little bit of time and a little bit of education, that seems to be working for me, finally. It's less scary than saying, well, you know, you're going to need $10,000 for the website that you want. That ends the discussion right there. And the web changes every day. Yep. One day the company is Google, and the next day it's Alphabet. How did that happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all in the uh, soup. John, you're an Alphabet employee. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we have used up our hour. Now, I, for one, am going to carry on talking in the after show. Uh, but we've really kind of got to pull the plug on the broadcast for this week. Uh, thanks, everyone, for turning up. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We will be back next week. I'm not sure what we're doing next week. So it will probably be a, a typically bogus hangout. Well, it isn't planned at all. Uh, the week after that, I'm great. I'm thinking we haven't had a ladies' night. We we need a ladies' night. <laughs> so that's yeah, all a lot of men here. 